that's okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, hello everyone, uh, my name is Ellie Clawton and I'm an independent data producer. Um, so today I'm going to go through a couple of things with you. So I'm going to start off by giving everyone kind of a bit of an overview of my career today, um, just sort of taking you through my journey and then um, I'm going to be going through some hot tips um, that I think are useful for people to know um, as a producer and then we'll probably open things up um, for questions so if you've got a question yeah you can ask me whatever um, so I'll start off by talking about how I got into producing I think I mean my career it wasn't I think if someone asked me 10 years told me 10 years ago that I was going to be a producer it would have been really I would have been like really that's literally not what I thought I would be when I was 16 I thought I wanted to be um, a heart surgeon so I've completely gone down from ridiculous route in comparison to that um, so I went to Newcastle University um, and studied English literature um, the reason being was that I just really really wanted to go to Newcastle because I'd heard it was an amazing university and I just I don't really know why I picked English literature but I did got halfway through the course and realized that I um, if I'm being perfectly honest had spent too much time drinking and going out and wasn't quite sure that what I wanted to do with my life so I kind of explored a few different options. Um, I joined the Television Society um, and did a bit of producing for that. Um, and then I had a look at the Theatre Society. I mean, theatre hadn't focused, hadn't been part of my life that much before university. I'd kind of, you know, done the classic thing of going to a couple of pantomimes when I was younger um, and sort of seeing things in that way. But actually, it wasn't really, it wasn't really part of my childhood in the way that um, it is in a lot of other people's. So I joined the Theatre Society knowing that I definitely didn't want to be an actor, didn't want to be a director, but thought, you know, maybe something like stage management or even what, whatever this producing thing was, I could have a go at it. Um, and I got involved in a play, it was called Chugger, and it was written by someone um, in the Theatre Society, and it was about, um, it was about <laughs> charity muggers or chuggers that were on Northumberland Street, which was a big street in Newcastle. And I really quickly realised that producing or whatever it was in that context was something that I was really interested in and I really liked. I basically realised I liked organising stuff for other people and facilitating whatever thing that they, whatever vision they had, I liked facilitating it. I realised that really, really quickly. After I graduated, I decided to stay in Newcastle for a year. Um, I worked in a burger restaurant for half the time to pay the bills and the rest of the time I kind of just explored the Newcastle theatre scene. So met with loads of theatre companies, worked for a couple of them, spent a lot of time at live in Newcastle, um, doing something on the stage, just sort of really exploring what the theatre scene was like and whether it was something that I wanted to do as a career. I then found out about um, the Mount View Creative Producers course. So there'd never been a creative producers course at Mount View and we were the first year. So I decided to do that, which I was obviously very fortunate to be able to do that in that it's, you know, formal training is quite expensive. And, um, but I was fortunate to be able to do that. And before that, um, before actually going to Mount View, I took my first show to Edinburgh, which was a show called Odd Shape Balls, which I did with a couple of uni friends. Um, and so it was a mixture of kind of throwing myself into the deep end and then deciding I was going to do some formal training. But I kind of knew from the beginning that if I wanted to do this job, I needed to do a mixture of both things. So something that, you know, when we were at Manview, they would always say to us was that producers produce stuff. And it was really important for me to be producing alongside education to make sure that I was putting those, you know, putting the skills that I was learning into practice. So I went to Manview for... Um, for a year, thought it was great, and um, was taught by an amazing man called Chris Grady, who, um, he was just brilliant, and he would bring in all these amazing people to come and talk to us about producing, and it was like really clear, it was really, it was a really good ground work for honing those key skills that you need as a producer, so finance, marketing, like anything, like we, we learned a little bit about everything, which was so, so useful. Um, so I did that for a year and then as part of that we were asked if we we were told that we needed to do an internship and so when I when I started work when I started sort of um, working within the theatre society in Newcastle I started seeing a lot more theatre and I spent a, and whenever Headlong would come in and do a tour show to Northern Stage I'd always go and see it because I just thought they were amazing and so when I went to Mount Booth when they asked if we wanted an internship I was like I need one at Headlong um, I must go there um, so I went and did an internship at Headlong. Um, it started off at one day a week, and then I started turning up two days a week, and then three days a week, and then four days a week, and then they couldn't really get rid of me. And so they offered me a job as an administrator. So that was my first proper role. 
as a within an arts organization um, and that kind of crossed over quite a lot with Mount View. it crossed over uh, about two or three months or so when I got the job so I'd go to Mount View on a Wednesday and do all my uh, practical work and you know essays and whatever I needed to do for my course and then the rest of the week I would I had four days a week at Headlong as the administrator so that was a mad time it was it was incredible because it really threw me in at the deep end so I was an administrator marketing assistant fundraising assistant producing assistant jeremy's pa like you name it i did it um and what i would and i was also producing work on, at the same time on the side so i produced two plays in london during that time so i did one at the finborough and one at the old red line just on the side so i would it so it was a really amazing experience but it was extremely full-on so i would wake up in the morning at something stupid like 6 30 do all my emails on the tube go to work on my lunch break carry on emails then finish the rest of the day and then i'd meet someone for a coffee or whatever and talk about making work afterwards um so it was a really hectic year but it was so invaluable and i think actually you know something that i believe is really true that about producing particularly independent producing is that you need a broad skill set across everything you need to or at least an understanding so something that headlong really gave me was i was in, in charge of the box office so they had a really small box office allocation um to all their for all their shows if they were taking them into the west end or whatever and i would manage that and having an insight into what that men and how it ran has been really really useful for me in my independent practice um, so yeah so that was a really great experience uh, about halfway into that uh, job i realized it wasn't going to continue after a year and i realized that i had two options i could either go down the production assistant route or i could go out on my own so i decided to go out on my own just purely for the fact that i thought i would find it a more rewarding experience and i would learn more just doing it myself so what i did was every time an associate director would walk through the door at headlong i saw i was the first person that they came into contact with so i'd always make sure that i said hi and i got to know them a little bit um because they're essentially the assistant and the associate directors they're probably the ones that you're going to work with in the future because they're kind of your age they're on your like level and actually they're the kind of people that i think are really important to make connections with them to me um so I would meet with them and actually I've ended up working with about three or four of them um, since then, which has been amazing. Some of them I've had really like lasting relationships, which has been, you know, incredible. Um, so I decided to go out on my own. So by that point I was working with a company called She Productions who are based in East Yorkshire, who, which is where I'm originally from. Um, and I worked, I worked with them for five years. So I'd been doing little bits of producing with them whilst I was at Mount Beale, whilst I was at Headlong. So I continued with that, so doing work for them. I then started picking up little projects um, just to kind of keep myself afloat and to cry, try and discover what kind of producer I was. They'd always ask us at Mount View, um, what kind of work do you want to make and what kind of producer are you? And I could never answer the question. I find it terrifying because I had no idea what it was that I was interested in. Everyone was so clear and they would go, well, musical theatre or, you know, uh, small scale, you know, touring or whatever and I had no idea what it was uh, as in what I was interested in so I tried to pick as many projects as possible that were different to be able to figure that out and just before I met and um, just before I left headlong I met Lung so I still work with Lung so Lung are a verbatim um, touring company um, who make work about issues in modern Britain and using people's actual words so verbatim as I say so I met them just before I left Headlong and um, we kind of clicked straight away. I was just brought on to do one project with them. I was brought on to do a show called E15 um, and that, it kind of just never ended. So it was just an initial contract to do E15 at Battersea Arts Centre and then I never left, um, which was amazing actually. And I think that's something that I always say to people when I talk to them about producing, like find the people that you click with. It's not just about the work, it's about the people as well, because they're the people that you have to interact with every day and have conversations with and, you know, make work with. So, you know, I think it's really important that you have those connections. And then after that, whilst we were doing E15 at Battersea Art Centre, Breach were doing Tank at Battersea Art Centre as well. And Matt and Helen from Lung went for lunch with Billy and Alice from Breach, and they were like, we don't want to produce our work anymore, we, want, we don't want to self-produce. And then Matt and Helen were like, have our producer. So I then met with Billy and Alice, got on with them really well, and then just ended up working with them forever. Um, but the thing about those two companies is that they are 
they're both similar in that they both make documentary style theatre in as loose a term as possible. You know, Breach, uh, Lung is more verbatim and Breach is definitely more documentary, but it's always, the source is always an actual event that they're building from, that they're making work from. And it's always, the aim of it is always to tackle some sort of social issue or it's political. And through working with them, it made me realise that I was, A, I think I work best in companies because I don't love just producing the shows. I love running the companies. So I love the strategy. I love the organisational development. I love, you know, even the boring things like annual budgets. Oh my gosh, I love them. They're so great. Um, And cash flows and all that kind of stuff. That's really like my... I just love it. But also just, you know, feeling like you're part of a team and part of a tribe is really nice and feeling like you're able to, you know, really, I really believe in the work that they make. And, you know, I mean, fingers crossed, but every idea that they've ever pitched to me, both companies, I've never, I've never turned around and been like, oh, I don't really align with that. I don't really understand what that is. Like we've had ideas where we've gone, okay, maybe that won't work, but it's never felt like it always feels like something that I really, really do align with and that I think is really special and I think that's what drives me through what can often be quite a hard job um so in terms of where I'm at so I've worked for both those companies for about three years now so I've been freelance yeah for three years um I think literally around like last month and uh, and proud to say as well you know that's been my only job I've never, I haven't since that time worked. Um, I've not done anything else. I've not had to take a part-time job or anything. Um, and all, you know, all my income has come through producing. And I think that is because at the beginning I was, I knew that some jobs that I'd have to take on weren't necessarily ones that I really wanted to do, but they were going to pay the bills. And they were also going to be learning experiences. I think sometimes you'll be doing a job where you don't necessarily align with work at the beginning, but you, um, you know that you will learn something through that. And you, the thing with producing is you always learn something like something always goes wrong or something always happens, which means you always gain some sort of experience from it, which I think is, is really, really useful. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at at the moment in terms of, um, other roles. I also, I'm a trustee of two companies, of two charities. Um, so one of them is She Productions, who I used to be the producer of, so I'm the chair of the board for them. So that role is kind of it's similar to producing in the sense of um, it's strategic, thinking about organisational development, making sure the company is running in the right way, but it's very it's hands-off. So you have board meetings every you know uh, three months or so, and you make sure that they're leading the company in the right way, and you're responsible for that. And then I work for another company called Zuko Creative, um, who are based in Croydon in London, who um, are amazing. They're a brilliant company, and so I'm a, I'm a trustee of that. And I, I find that role really rewarding, and it actually really helps me. Um, I think it's really helped me develop as a producer. And I would say that you know I would urge anyone if they can some point to get on a board I think it's a really useful thing to do to be able to look inside another organization and I think more and more companies probably should be encouraged to have younger people on their boards too just purely because a lot of boards have a lot of older older boys on it and we should we should change that um so that's kind of I also work for Barrel Organ as well which are another company that um like Breach came out of Warwick University um but they're kind of going for a little bit of a quiet period at the moment but we're still sort of bubbling on projects and then I also do a lot of consultancy work as well um which I really really enjoy just sort of giving advice on arts council applications or um doing some organizational organizational development with people tour booking um I guess in terms of the day-to-day it might be useful just for me to go through the like day-to-day of what my actual job is within these companies because it is quite you know I've touched on a little bit about producing the work but also running the companies but in terms of what that entails it's it is pretty much everything so when it comes to making work like matt and helen or billy Ellis and dorothy from breach they will lead on the ideas and the creation but i am the facilitator of that vision in the sense of the money the logistics the tour booking the marketing the press like the finance the accounting that's all done by me so 
anything logistical at all has to run through me. So the reason, you know, so when we did It's True, It's True, It's True, which is a show that Breach did, you know, that was the first time that Breach had never done any producing for their work. I facilitated the room that they were able to make that piece of work in. And they didn't have to think about any sort, they didn't have to worry about anything. They just thought about the creative vision. And I think that's what really, you know, that is what the role of a producer is, I think, for particular, in my eyes anyway, is to be able to allow those people to hold, solely think about their creative vision. And that doesn't mean they don't get involved in the marketing or anything like that. You know, like that is creative as well and therefore they have to be a part of that. But the logistics of it and leading on it, that is very much me. And then I guess the other part of the role is, um, like I say, organisational development. So making, you know, when I met both the companies, they were start, they were starting to become quite well known within the industry in terms of being, you know, innovative, exciting, small scale theatre companies. And what I have done for them is help them become more sustainable. So anything from sorting out their bank account, which was a mess, <laughs> just because no one teaches you how to properly set up a bank account for a business like when you first start out to becoming a charity for both companies building a board um writing proper business plans writing proper fundraising plans employing a fundraiser and working with them to write trust and foundations applications all of that stuff is my job um so it's a mixture of you know producing the work and running a company which as i say i really enjoy i think the final thing i'll kind of touch on before i go into kind of hot tips into producing is um plans for the future and what the future looks like at the moment. In terms of plans for the future for myself, I kind of am just, I, I don't really know, but I think I would like to hopefully facilitate both Breach and Lung to become companies that are potentially NPOs or they are considered to be amongst the like best touring theatre companies in the country in terms of, you know, like the new, because headlong complicity and all that kind of thing they're brilliant amazing wonderful companies and i think but i think it's important for new exciting companies to be coming along all the time and i think i would like those companies to be up there with them eventually in the next sort of five ten years and therefore to be an exec director of one of those companies um so running an mpo running a charity and then eventually maybe moving into something else in terms of another organization um i think I think companies are definitely my kind of thing, but I wouldn't be adverse to running a building or something like that. But who knows? We don't know. See what happens. And in terms of the future of kind of um, COVID or whatever. So we've both been lucky enough for Lung and Breach to get Arts Council emergency grants, which has actually enabled us to have part-time salaries throughout this period, which is really exciting, but also difficult because we don't know what we've, got part-time salaries and then after October who knows what will happen so my mission at the moment is to try and make sure that we can sustain ourselves post-October and that the work can still happen and we can still make work during this period which we are doing for both companies so trying to keep creative but also be kind to ourselves and have a little bit of a respite actually and um, we're taking a little bit of time to chill because we've worked solidly for like three four years and I think it's time to sort of just you know chill for a little bit so that's kind of an overview of my career so far and what I've been up to and I thought it would be useful to just sort of go through some snippets of advice things that I've kind of learned along the way and I think is really important to share with people who would like to be a producer or who are producing um, so yeah I'll just go through those four and then we can open up to questions so the first one the first one which is something that I learned really early on is audience is everything so what I mean by audience is I don't mean just the people who walk through the door and see the show. I also mean audience in terms of people participating, participating either through workshops or engagement work or people, if it's an engagement led project, people participating in the creation of the show. Those people are the most important people because A, who is it for otherwise and B, like, with Lung, we make, so Lung makes engagement-led work and we make work really specifically about specific communities or specific groups of people. We have to be thinking about those people from the second we come up with the idea because it's about, their, it's about them and it's about finding out what it is 
that they want to say about their story and about their lives and the best way in which we can do that the most sensitive but the most but also most provoking and entertaining way so with Trojan Horse you know it's that's a show that we did with Lung and it was about a scandal in Birmingham schools in 2014 we worked really closely with the teachers and governors who were part of that scandal and it was really important to ensure that we not only interviewed them, but we worked really close with them to find out what they wanted to do and what it was that they wanted to achieve with this piece of work. And they've been intrinsic from, you know, the making of the, making of the play because it's their words to the development of the engagement package or the ask for when we go to the Houses of Parliament, whenever that happens, hopefully, within the next year. Because um, obviously, alongside the actual work, Lung do a lot of kind of political rallying, um, which is really exciting. And having those communities involved in that from the beginning is really important to us. And I think in terms of, you know, audiences in general, an exercise that I always do, which I very openly will say I stole from Mr. Chris Grady from Mount is that who are the three people you want on the front row of that um, audience? Like, who is it? Your mum? Is it um, a counsellor from the local council who is going to advocate for the particular thing that you're talking about? Um, or is it... Um, as with Trojan Horse, is it um, urgent speaking communities from around the country that you want to be able to access that work? So we're having a really clear from the beginning, like three people, and what I mean by people is groups of people that you want to have on the front row is really important because from that, that will help you to be able to develop a really strong audience development and marketing plan, um, which is in terms of audience development and marketing plans I try and do them well I do do them for every project we tend to put them um, we tend to attach them as part of our arts council applications but they're just so important for you to be able to work out how you're going to get if you know who the audience is you can then work out how you're going to get them in and none of that tends to be most of the time actually it never it never comes with the additional you know I'm finding, for, particularly for small-scale touring, it never comes with an additional monetary cost. It tends to just be a lot of thinking around, okay, well, how do I find this audience? How do I reach them? And it tends to be something, you know, if you're, for example, trying to reach um, early speaking, you know, non-theatre-going audiences, what we worked out from that was actually it's best to go to the, their community spaces and just chat to them about the show and get them to come in. So, like, by identifying who you want to be on the front row you can then think about what it is that you're going to do in order to get them in and then hopefully it's therefore more successful um and i do sometimes think that people think about marketing as the last thing particularly for an independent producer like you're just constantly doing so much stuff that you're like oh i'll think about marketing later but then it's sometimes it's, you know a little bit too late so i'd say that audience you know audience is everything i think they're the people that you want to be when you're coming with an idea, you're going, who is this for? What is the intention? Um, so that would be my first piece of advice. The second would be um, thinking about relationships. So what I mean by relationships, I mean, I touched on a little bit to begin with, um, relationships in terms of people that you work with. So you can be making the most amazing piece of work, but if you don't have a good relationship with the people that you're working with, I think I honestly believe that that piece of work will only go so far, particularly because you, or you won't go with it because you won't be able to, you won't be able to do it because you just can't, if you can't communicate with people and you can't have a good working relationship with people, I think it's only sustainable for so long. And I think it's really important to, and therefore I think it's, really important to really find your tribe and really as i say and find the people that you really enjoy working with and it you know i you know work i work with rich and lung just constantly and i don't tend to work with that many other people beyond barrel organ etc but that's my gang and i love it and i think they're great and i feel like i'm the right person to facilitate their to facilitate their work and my ethos really aligns with their ethos and therefore it's like a perfect match and so I would say there, that's the key relationship you want to build before you're kind of, you know, building other relationships. I mean, obviously alongside it, a really um, important relationship is venues around the company, around the country, sorry. Um, so as an independent producer, you are kind of flogging your wares constantly. And therefore I think it's so important to be able to have a, as wide a net of people as possible that you can go to. Um, and I think a really easy way of doing this is by, if you're, for example, um, taking a show to Edinburgh, 
and you're inviting people to come and see your work, I would advise that if you're inviting a theatre to come, to come and see your work, just book in like literally two minutes afterwards to say hi to that person who's come to see the show. So, you know, if we, when we did Who Cares last year, if people would come and see the work, I'd just make sure I was outside the theatre afterwards just so I could say hi to them and just, just put a face to a name. Because we spend so much time emailing people um, that you never actually get to see their faces. And so it's really nice. And then they remember you and then also just... They remember that you're nice and that they and that you were a you know nice person to talk to you quickly and then therefore when you email them a few weeks later with a tour pack for the show they'll go ah okay that was ellie that i spoke to in the bar of wherever somewhere like edinburgh is so good for that i mean we do a lot of shows at summer hall anyway but i spend a lot of time in summer hall beer garden a drinking gin but b saying hi to people and just because also as well the great thing about places like that is you know and they exist all over they you know i'm sure in liverpool there's places like this and i i work a lot in hull and there's places where theatre, the theatre community congregate and a place tends to be middle child's offices in a place called darley's you know those spaces are great because ultimately the people that i think are the most important to get to know are your peers i think a lot of people spend and this is something I learned really early on. People spend a lot of time looking up and aspiring upwards and going, I really want to be headlong or I really want to be the Royal Corps and I really want to be this person. Well, the people that are around you will be in those organisations one day. And actually, if you form relationships with them and you form your gangs with creatives, with writers, with whoever, like you will all build up together. And you will all create this amazing so the people that you're looking up at if you're building up together like then people will be able to then you'll be there eventually and i mean the hope is that when we're in those positions when people are looking down we'll be able to talk to them and have nice conversations with them and not ignore them but you know <laughs> we'll see um so i think looking around you and having, creating those peer relationships is really really important um and i think with ven i think you know the venue thing is really it just makes it so much easier if you said hi to someone, you know, in Edinburgh or even drop them an email or whatever. It just makes it so much easier when you're tour booking because then you've got a friendly connection, a friendly relationship. And I think, you know, I think I've benefited quite a lot from just being a nice person and just saying hi to people and just being like, yeah, just feeling approachable and just feeling, you know, because I, I think it's also difficult for venues because they must get so many emails all the time from producers and people trying to book shows and whatever. And, you know, I think sometimes it can make it easy for you if you're just able to have that face-to-face -face contact with them. I mean, obviously it's very difficult at the moment because everybody's on Zoom, but even then, you know. So I'd say, yeah, relationships in those senses are really key and I think even relationships in terms of I know it's a little bit more tricky nowadays but with you know people from the Arts Council like so I work so I work really closely with Hannah Bentley who's the Yorkshire Arts Council relationship manager so we I made sure really early on that me and her had a really good um relationship and then Will Young in London like we have you know I know him quite well and so therefore I think having those personal relationships is really important um and also I think obviously I was talking about the looking up stuff but I think I do, but I do think there's a lot of value in mentor, mentorship. So I have a few mentors who are on various different levels of their career, um, but most of which are between maybe I would say like three to six years above me, because I think then they can kind of, just because I think it's important for that to have someone that can quite easily reflect on the place that you were in. Um, right, and also, we know how the ecology of theatre changes so quickly um, just because of you know economics and all that kind of stuff so therefore having someone that's sort of close to where you're at is really useful um, so my last two points one of them is communication within creative teams um, the reason i say this is because sometimes when you work with when you when you've worked with a team for a long time there is a lot of assumptions and you have this language where you basically don't have to say what you mean because you've worked together for so long and so you can read. So Matt and Helen, like, I know the way that they think now. I know how they communicate. And so therefore it makes my job a lot easier. Same with Billy and Ellis and Dorothy. Like, it makes my life so much easier to be able to know where, how they're thinking, what they're, you know, what, 
how their brain is processing. But when you're bringing in new creatives, when you're working with other team members and other venues, you should never assume that they know how you work and how you communicate. So I think it's really important to be clear about that from the beginning. So an example would be, so with Trojan Horse, we had a massive engagement package that went around it where it was um, this live Urdu translation, which had to be set up beforehand. We were trying to bring in um, non-theatre Muslim community goers um, into the theatre. We were offering tickets to school children to come and see the show. Like there was a lot of different elements that were going on and there was an engagement manager which toured with the show. But that person was brought on like two months before and then it was Matt and Helen leading on it, but I was doing the tour booking. So you can see there's a lot of different people involved in that show. And so therefore, we decided that what we would do is we would draw up a really simple chart, which was just a flow chart, which basically was like, talk to this person, talk to this person, talk to this person. Because we'd found, we did, this is what we did for the February, for the February tool that just happened. Because we found an autumn, it was really difficult. People were like, who am I talking to? Just because there were so many of us. And I think it was really, it's really hard to, you know, to be able to be, you've got to be really clear from the beginning. I think also, when you're making engagement led work, it's important communication is so key, particularly when you're speaking to the participants um, or the interviewees, like really clear what their role is and what you're asking from them and the way that their words will be represented. Obviously that's sometimes you are, people are gonna come out not looking as great as they would like to, but you have to, as long as you're clear with people what the intention of the project is, that's really, really important. I mean, obviously we never ask Michael Gove if we can, be mean about him but his words were in the public domain etc so that's fine but I mean more the kind of the teachers and the governors or you know with who cares the young people because these are you know the, there are you know they're adults now most of them but when we first started working on the project they were you know young people like they were kids so therefore it's really important to make sure that they know what the project is and what they're going to get out of it because you know it can be really tricky for them otherwise um, creatives as well like what their role is and what you expect from them the thing that is always tricky is particularly when you're producing on a small scale is things like fees and stuff like that and how that's going to work and if the show's remounted will they get another fee etc etc it's really hard to know how well the show's going to do so therefore committing to certain fees and stuff can be difficult but with lung and with breach we have a clear this is how much you get paid for the R&D. If it goes on, we'll talk about this in good faith, et cetera, et cetera. But just making sure that they know that so they don't ever feel unclear as to what they're doing. And the same with actors as well. I think just be open and honest with them and clear with them. They, something I find particularly with touring is they like to know as much as possible. So like we give them tour packs of where they're going, where they're staying, all the facilities around there. Just being as clear as possible with them about trains and just lots of clarity lots of communication but also on the flip side of that i would know what not to communicate as well i think there's certain things that you don't want to be letting people in on just purely because you know if you're having an issue within the production team the actors don't need to know that they don't need to be part of that conversation at all because that stops them from doing their job so thinking really clearly as to what are the best things to communicate to people um so being transparent but also not telling them things that stop them from doing their from doing their job so i think communication is a really important thing and i guess the last thing is actually is mental health and well-being like so i know you know it may seem obvious but oh my gosh so important so as i said before when i was at headlong working all those hours and you know doing producing alongside and all that kind of stuff it worked fine when i first started out but i did it for about a year and a half and then after that i was like I can't do this because I just burnt out. And actually I've gone through a series of working, 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 and then just completely burning out and just having a horrific time. Um, towards the end of last year, just I'd worked solidly for the whole year, hadn't stopped. And it made me feel awful by the end of it. I felt miserable. I was really anxious. I've always been quite an anxious, you know, suffered from anxiety or whatever, but it made me really anxious. It made me stop enjoying what I was doing. So over Christmas, I just made sure that I properly rested and took a respite and just looked after myself. Um, because it, otherwise, you if you're not looking after yourself, you can't look after the people that you're working for. Because ultimately, something that you will, something that happens to producers is that um, people put all their problems on you because you're 
or you're the person who organized everything, you're the person in charge of logistics, but then who do you offload to? That's really difficult to then take on all that baggage and then it's like, oh gosh, where do I put it? The only other people, you know, the only other time that that happens is, you know, therapists do that and then they, you know, they're trained to offload stuff, but you literally get all this stuff from people and then you're like, oh gosh, where do I put it? So putting things in place to make sure that you can offload, you know, that way is really important, whether that's going to see your mates, I do a lot of baking, do a lot of exercise, just that kind of stuff. And I think also knowing the way that which you work, I think I realised I'm not, a, I thought I was a 10 to 6 kind of person. I was like, works with 10, finish at 6, that's what I'm doing, that's fine. I now realise I'm a task-based person. So I'll set myself a certain amount of tasks for the day and I tend to work on one company a day. Um, so I'll do, so I do two and a half days a week for London Breach at the moment. So I'll do a day and then one of them I'll split. So day for London, day for Breach, split day, day for London, day for Breach. And that tends to work quite well. But then I will set tasks. So I'll be like, today I'm going to write this part of this Arts Council application. I can't do the whole thing in one day most of the time. I have to just do it in sections. But just finding out how that works for you. And making sure that yeah I add in the stuff that I enjoy in the middle or like in an evening I think particularly at the moment when you know everything's so tricky um but yeah I'd say that mental health and well-being is so important as an independent producer because you are doing everything you're doing so much stuff and therefore you need to look after yourself in order to be able to do the best the best job so that's my kind of hot tips on producing should we open up to questions guys cool yeah so um, we've got a couple of questions um, that came through um, before before our chat, and then if people want to just um, send me or send everybody um, questions that you'd like, like Ellie to answer while we go through the first couple, do put it in the chat. So the first question um, was: Are there any social media pages, or I guess other online resources, um, you would suggest following for opportunities or tips? So I don't know if anyone's heard of UK Theatre Producers, the Facebook group. Um, so there's a group that was set up, I think, in like 2014 by Jake Orr, who is an independent producer and producer of Nottingham Playhouse, um, which has opportunities and all sorts of different things on there for um, different jobs, but also like different events and things like that, which is really useful. Um, but then there's also, I mean, arts jobs is really useful actually. There's always lots of little things on there to have a look at, um, jobs and things like that. Um, I think opportunity wise, I think Twitter is usually pretty good for stuff like that. I've just there to Twitter in general. People tend to be posting things all the time. I know Linda Bloomfield does, she does Opportunities Tuesday, um, which is not just for producing, it's for, you know, theatre makers in general. It's all sorts of different writing commissions and producers opportunities. Um, so that's really, really useful. But I'd say Twitter in general, I think people tend to post stuff on there. Um, so I think just keep an eye on stuff like that. Great, thank you. Um, and the next one was from Nikki. It was, how do you go about doing your first small scale tour? So who would you hire to do this if you've never done one before? How would you go about starting off? Oh, that's an interesting one. So I guess the first thing I would do when I was doing a small scale tour is I would, so I'd obviously look at the piece of work that I wanted to do. And again, I'd go back to that thing about audience and be like, who is this for? So, cause that will answer a lot of questions for you, I think. Um, in terms of, um, so like, say for example, you wanted to do a tour of a children's show. I would do a bit of research into small scale theatres theaters that take kids work um, and that have, so, and also small scale theatre companies that have toured kids work as well and where they've gone. So I would kind of do a bit of research into companies like this amazing um, small scale kids company uh, based in Hull called The Herd. I'd go on their website and be like, oh, where have they toured to and have a look at that. Because then you can have kind of have a sense of where you want to go and what you're going to do and you know the audiences that you're going to reach. So once you've done that and once you've kind of figured out a little bit about um, where you want to go and what you want to do, you can then sort of start to write a budget. I'd say the budget was the next thing because then you can figure out how much it's going to cost in terms because you'll know how many weeks that you're going to be touring for or how many days or whatever. So I would then write a budget based on that. In terms of um, you know budgeting what you want to be focusing on is obviously the creatives and who you're paying 
you want to be focusing on any set production costs, then also focusing on any marketing costs. I think for you, for a first small scale tool, keep it as simple as possible, but just think of any cost that you think will be incurred during that time. And then my next step would be putting together a really good tour pack. If you've done the show before and have any images from it, that's really handy and really great. Um, but if not, then if you have graphics or poster images or whatever, then I would use those and start to create a really good tour pack, which has all the information about the show in it that you can then send to the theatres. Um, I would then try and get in contact with theatres. In terms of getting in contact with theatres, like I say, they must get millions of emails all the time. So I sometimes often, if I don't have an in with the theatre, I'll find someone who's got an in with them and try and ask them for a bit of a favour to help me. And if they align with the work, they tend to say yes and usually help you out. And after that, you would then get in contact with the theatre and then start talking about deals. Um, in terms of small scale touring, it's expensive for the main reason that the the deal that you'll get as part of is as part of the um being in that space doesn't always tend to cover the cost of actually putting the show on so therefore you will need additional funding so therefore you would go to someone like the arts council for that but in order to go to the arts council you need to have some match funding from the theater so for example a fee or ticket sales from the theatre so that's why you would go to the theatre and then negotiate that fee with them so that's the kind of sort of beginning steps which sound quite complicated now I'm saying them, but actually they were they do reveal themselves to like that it makes sense in that kind of you know in that kind of way does that answer the question yeah yeah I think that's really informative thanks um so another question is you went to you mentioned you went to Mountview and you got your internship through them. Um, someone wants to know if um, how do you know of any other internships or other trainee producer opportunities that might be open to people? So there's um, I know improbable do internships. I know I think when when it comes to internships, I think it's my advice. I think would be there are a lot of formal ones but i think it goes back to that building relationships thing i know a lot of theaters can't necessarily offer theater internships but i think forging relationships as you know i'm sure the people in this zoom have done with you guys forming relationships with your local theater is really important and can lead to interesting opportunities so for example um so my local theater is east riding theater in beverly which is where um, i grew up and they didn't originally offer internships, but they were contacted by a student, I think out of the blue from Hull University who was doing drama and asked if she could come and work there and do an internship. Um, and they said yes, and she worked there for like, and they paid her as well um, for the internship. And, in, and she ended up working there one day a week as like an administrative assistant. And now I think she works there two days a week. So that's an example of, you know, I know that's not always going to happen, but I think that's an example of, you know, putting yourself out there and then getting, getting some results from it. I think the really difficult thing about internships is that economically they're not great because sometimes you don't get paid and you need to be able to pay your bills. Again, you know, when I was at Headlong, it wasn't a paid internship and I was in a really fortunate position to be able to, to be able to, you know, go to Mount View and all that kind of stuff. But it does sometimes make it tricky because, they, yeah, those internships aren't paid. So I think what, to be honest, I think the better thing to do is to try and get in with a smaller scale company that are willing to, if they need some administrative work and they're willing to sort of pay, pay you. So, for example, my, so I met my assistant, Grace, through Mount View. She was on the Mount View course. In fact, I met her before she went to Mount View. Um, and then I think I told her to do the Mount View course. Um, but she ended up working, she, you know, she interned for me for like a little bit of time. And then I was like, oh, actually, you're just really great and really exciting. So I brought her on and actually employed her. And she, we worked together for like a year. Um, and I think actually get, she learned so much stuff by doing all that stuff with me. Because she wanted to be an independent producer, then I think it was more useful for her than, say, for example, you know, inputting data in the Royal Courts database. Not to say that's not useful, but... I think it works differently for different people. Yeah, no, completely. Um, I guess on the wage thing and the money thing again, um, someone to know um, how 
so before the current crisis and that's obviously changed lots of things for lots of people um but how did you sustain um sort of a regular income for yourself and the teams that you work with um in between projects and doing company management stuff or are you able to get um project funding sort of rolling or so the way that it works for me is it's a massive jigsaw puzzle um so what i do is i have a spreadsheet which basically it basically details all my outgoings for the month in terms of like what i think i'm going to spend and that sort of goes throughout the whole year so it starts in january and goes through to december and what i do up until obviously recently um i would be paid on a project by project basis and i would be just really clear from the beginning what it was i was going to be paid for that project i've always been quite clear about it and I've always been very upfront about the fact that I need to be paid the thing that is hard is because you can't always guarantee it but the thing for me I mean I was the one raising the money I was the one that was basically apart from the first time that Breach and Lung brought me on which was a set fee where they were like here's x amount of money to do this project every other single project the money has been found by me and the money for everybody else has been found by you know found by me as well in terms of you know sustaining myself I'd be I, I'm able to just sort of take all the projects and then just sort of slot them alongside one another. I don't really do the thing of like, they kind of even themselves out, but I never really did the thing of being like, well, you've paid me loads of money, so therefore I'm gonna give you loads of time and you've not paid me as much because actually by the end of the year, one of them will have changed because they're touring. So they're kind of, the agreement we have really is that I just work split between breach and lung. And now it is split equally in terms of money, but actually throughout the year they balance, they used to balance each other out, you know, but at different points. Because I also tried to avoid, I mean, I didn't do this at the end of the last year, but tried to avoid touring at the same time or whatever, but inevitably you always do that. So that's kind of how I did it. Um, but it was definitely, it took a bit of time to get used to and to, and to do. And, you know, at the beginning it was like, I was living off the bare minimum. I was barely, you know, I was, it was hard, but it, you know, and would just not go out for dinner or, or hang out, you know, whatever. But it got a lot, it gets a lot easier. But if you can just, I think, manage it in that way, it makes it a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, get, I guess, again, related to the current situation we find ourselves, um, as a freelance, would you recommend joining a union in, in this current situation? So I'm not part of a union. And I never have really thought about it. I think, I don't really know, potentially. I think, uh, I mean, I, I'm a member of those kind of, I'm a member of UK Theatre and ITC, which I guess, you know, are in a sense. But I think, I think it's really hard to know, to be honest, if it's useful or not. It's a really tricky thing. I, you know, not, it's useful being part of ITC and UK Theatre just purely because you get newsletters and information about stuff, but that stuff trickles through anyway, I think. Mm. Um, I think there's this whole other conversation at the moment about whether people are being, you know, included in conversations about freelance artists and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's just, there's so many of us, it's so difficult to break through and be part of the noise. Um, I think sometimes, uh, particularly at the moment, you've just got to do what's right for you. No, completely. And as you say, with ITC um, available with all that kind of advice, you've got ACAS from a HR perspective as well. Um, and I guess from a freelance point of view, you just need to consider whether you can um, ensure you can have that monthly payment to a union as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so from a slightly different perspective, um, we've got someone who's working as a lighting designer and a production assistant. And they're wondering, mm -hmm. um, how would they would network with theatre companies? So should they, do they email a producer or do, is it better to talk to directors? Um, how would you get into a company that you want to work with? I think a bit of both. I mean, it, I think, you know, it depends on the company because every company hires people in different ways. You know, I tend to be quite involved in the process of um, hiring creators when it comes to both companies, but some people, some producers aren't necessarily. I think making sure you see their, you know, see their work, again, obviously difficult because of the climate they're in at the moment, but going to see their work and trying to catch them afterwards to say hi, um, asking if you can go for a coffee with them. I think that's, or getting in contact as well with the people that have designed for them before. 
and you know trying to get in that way um i think is a good way of doing it yeah no that sounds that sounds great um just a couple more and then we'll wrap up um in terms of project fundraising um so obviously arts council tends to be one of the main sources people go to um are there any other sources you you apply to on a regular basis and i guess i'm just adding from my perspective a breach um another company are they um do you set themselves are they set up as cic's or other kind of formal entities to allow themselves to go for other funding so at the moment the majority of our funding does come from the arts council um, it works a bit differently for both companies so for lung um we are now a charity and therefore we're open up to a bit more to more trust and foundations so that makes it a lot easier for us um, and we're now starting to raise money rather than by projects but by programs so programs mm -hmm. of work and also for core funding so that's how we do it for that we also get a lot of money from universities um, because we always have academic advisors on our projects and so therefore they're able to access money usually around the engagement projects and usually around the evaluation of the engagement projects which is always really useful there's little pockets of money which are um, accessible through trust and foundations um, for people that aren't charities so for example um, unity theatre trust which is nothing to do with, is that to do with you guys and nothing to do with us but they're great yeah, yeah. but they're great <laughs> they give like little pockets of like 500 quid out quite easily they're brilliant Royal Victoria Hall Foundation, if you're doing a show in London, they give up to 1,500, who are really great. Um, there's also things like, for specifically for writing plays and for directing, there's the Peggy Ramsey Foundation, you can apply to for, uh, writing, for writing. And then also there's the John Fernard Award, which is a directing award. Um, so Matt's won that, and they've both won Peggy Ramsey as well. So they're like little different pots of money. I mean, when you're first starting out, a Kickstarter is always good, but probably only works once, um, i found. So for the first project I ever did, we did a Kickstarter and raised like three grand. Um, I think when you're first starting out, the creative fundraising thing really is important. Like, I think Kickstarters are really good for that kind of creative fundraising and sort of thinking about, you know, different ways in which you can get money. Sponsorship sometimes helps, but really specific sponsorship. So Lung has sponsorship from a law firm that we've worked with. They sponsor us um, quite a bit. So we're so in terms of so Lung were a limited company. Well, we're transitioning, but I'm now a CIO, which is a charitable incorporated organisation, which is a halfway house between a limited company and a charity. And the reason we did that was because it's it's a little bit of a simpler um, structure, and actually it means we only have to submit our um, papers to, to one organisation. And but breach our uh, LLP no idea why do not become an llp is not a good idea someone told them to become an llp and it has been an absolute nightmare so it's a limited liability partnership and for the most part that's what lawyers become so when partners in law firms join together they become llps don't know why um they were advised to do that but what it has done which is not great is that it has stopped us from being able to claim theatre tax relief so you can't claim theatre tax relief if you're an LLP, which is why I'm trying so hard to get us into this charity status thing, because theatre tax relief is amazing. So what it is, is it's this, um, you can apply for it if you're a limited company. If you have your production budget, um, you can claim tax back on all the capitalisation costs, excluding marketing, and then any get out costs. So like your rehearsal costs, your production costs, all that stuff can claim tax back so for you know for a big big 100 grand tour you can claim like 15 to 20 grand back which is so good whereas for brick you know so for trojan horse amazing for it's true it's true, it's true never going to see that money which is infuriating but it is what it is so don't become an llp that's something i will say so that's kind of yeah that's the main sort of income generation that we sort of have great and i would say um it's something if sort of the different structures of companies are of interest to people it's something we're looking at running um, yeah. a particular session on so let us know if, if that's of interest and i would say from a fundraising perspective it is quite limiting if you don't have that some kind of formal structure because yeah, yeah. yeah the arts council and and those trusts and um, that ellie mentioned are the main ones you can go for if, in, unless you have that formal structure in place yeah. um, and then um, final question um, so how are you and the companies you work with currently um, connecting discussing making work um, 
in, you know, not being able to be in the same space? And then just how are you keeping inspired? Is there anything that you've particularly seen that's come out of this that's kind of keeping you going? Any other tips? So um, for Lung, it's, it's slightly easier in that, so all of their work is interview based, so that can be done quite easily on Zoom. The thing about Matt and Helen is they are just, just ideas just everywhere, just constantly, all the time, and it's amazing. Um, so we're doing a project about looked after children at the moment with Queen's Theatre Church, and we've been doing weekly workshops with those kids. They were in person, they've now moved online, so they just carry those on. And then um, they're also researching and interviewing for two other projects and they've just done all that online so that's been all right because it's like they can just sort of crack on with it um the thing that we're going to find interesting i think is uh yeah the looked after children project is a musical how we're going to do that with our composer i have not got a clue um but we are delving into that at the moment and then with breach um so yeah we're develop we're developing a few new projects and what billy and ellis and dorothy do is they have a weekly um artistic planning session um so they will basically just meet once a week sorry if phone's going off in the background um they'll meet once a week and they'll have conversations about um work and they will bring ideas into the table and ask one another to go away and read an article or watch a film or whatever and then they'll come together and then they'll talk about it and then we're aiming towards we do a residency week each year so we're aiming towards a residency week in a few months where we will then all get in a room and have a conversation and come up with ideas and sort of see what happens but they also do like online writing stuff together and all that kind of thing um in terms of staying creative i think not putting to i think it's difficult because people work in different ways matt and helen and um, they fortunately like live together so they're able to just sort of crack on and they're always they just you know always love to push forward with stuff whereas um the breach team when none of us are in the same space and sometimes it can be difficult to motivate yourself and be creative and particularly as well for breach like we were, i should literally be in new york right now and i'm not because of everything that's happened with it's true and that was that uh, that really knocked the wind from our sails a, a little bit you know we we really had to sort of stop and take time to process all of that before we were able to move on and do stuff so i think not putting pressure on yourself and i think stepping back and sort of one thing i've been doing is i've just been relaxing and sleeping and having a nice time whilst also doing you know bits of work but actually by doing that it made me feel more creative like watching things on tv or you know watching films or reading books and stuff like that's really really helped um and i think also just making sure if you're part of a team making sure you look after one another and just checking in we do a check-in at the beginning of every meeting and if people don't want to talk about stuff they don't want to talk about it and if we don't feel like the meeting needs to run for too long we cut it short we just or we just chat about rubbish or you know i think having that flexibility is really important during this sort of time great oh amazing tips thanks so much ellie um can i hand over to the other rachel <laughs> just to wrap up okay um fab so thank you so much ellie that was incredible um really really appreciative of your time and sharing all that with us it was um yeah brilliant i made loads of notes um and yeah some of them i might even get on quote cards and stick on my wall um, <laughs> just um yeah and i think that last point as well about not really feeling the pressure to do too much be too creative is really important because it's awfully noisy out there at the moment and i think that would be our word of warning as well is just do what's right for you um nobody's going to be measuring you against this time so really look after yourself and each other um, I'm just going to uh, wrap up by letting you know about a couple of opportunities um, for you on this call. So um, quite a few things came up in your questions to Ellie there that we're going to try and hopefully answer through some more sessions. So as well as these No One Way series, we've got um, our Creative Collective. The Creative Collective is an online database and network networking centre for Liverpool-based artists. We set it up a couple of weeks ago. And what it is, is it gives you the opportunity to uh, meet other producers in the city, but also meet writers if that's how you want to connect. You may actually be in need of quite a specific skill, like somebody who can operate a loop pedal. Um, the idea is that you can really easily access um, all these people with all these different skills and just keep in touch with each other, work out the climate of the city, 
find that place like Ellie mentioned where you can all meet up while we can't do it in a bar or on Hope Street or wherever it is in Liverpool we can do it online hopefully through sessions like this so um would really encourage you to sign up to the creative collective database um uh, fundraising audience development planning financial planning um uh legality they're all things we're going to hopefully cover in our business skills sessions um called building a business again they were actually came from you guys in that first zoom we did back in april 47 years ago or whenever april was um and uh, but any other ideas you have for those kind of skills based sessions um if we can't facilitate them we can absolutely try and find somebody who can so please do um drop us a line with any ideas about that. And then I think lastly, it's just about um, the upcoming sessions we've got. So um, we've also got Gitika joining us on Monday, who's a um, director, and she's specifically looking at um, creating diverse work and um, modeling that diverse work for audiences. Um, and then at the end of the week, we've got Luke Barnes, who's a playwright. Um, from Liverpool, who I'm sure a lot of you will have heard of or seen his work as well. So I'd really encourage you to check out the rest of the series. Um, very lastly, we have a page on our website now, which is for you to give us feedback or just let us know how we can help more. We're really trying to speak to as many people as possible through this, but inevitably um, we will miss some people. And so this page on our website is to really try and make sure you feel like you can contact us if you have an idea, if you just want reassurance, if you you know want a bit more insight into the industry that you maybe can't find through the noise of theatre, Twitter, it is an open text box for you to get in top contact with us. You'll find it in the Artist Hub section of our website. So yeah, please do use it. We really love hearing from everybody. Um, and again, thank you so much, Ellie. This has been brilliant. Um, and we 